Well, they've had eating on for the best part of a day and a half, and it's still a bit nippy, isn't it? Still a little bit cold. Hopefully, you now you'll be leaving a little bit warmer after the gospel, anyway. Um, we begin by saying, Rejoice in the Lord always. Well, there's three people who are saved. <laughs> Rejoice in the Lord always. In the name of the Lord. There we are, praise God. Well, most of you seem saved at least then. And it's at least warm when you up as well, praise God. Let's come to sing our first hymn or carol here this evening, which is the first Noel, the angel did say, was the certain poor shepherds in the fields as they lay. We'll stand to praise.
praise God. Good little carol, but I forgot how long it was, to be honest. So ask me preaching now for five minutes. You probably, some of you thinking, sing it again. Get it down to two minutes. Here we are, let's bow our heads to pray. <coughs> Father, we come before your throne of grace, Lord, with exaltation and adoration in our hearts, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that as we come here, we are reflecting on the great truth that the eternal Son of God became flesh, wrapped himself in humanity, was fully God and fully man, in order to make his way, live his life obediently, perfectly obediently under the law of Moses, to the cross, to make the atoning sacrifice for his people, to endure your wrath, Lord, to uphold your holy character, and to redeem a bride for himself, a people that you have given him from before the foundation of the world. It's a profound truth, Lord. We see these truths littered through Scripture. This is why, Lord, I pray here this day that you would give us a great desire for your word, Lord, that we would saturate ourselves in it and to know the truth of the word of God from old to new, Lord, from beginning to end. And we could never exhaust it, Lord, the depths of it. It's so profoundly full of truth and revelation and you were revealing uh, secrets and great mysteries from your heart to ours. And who are we, Lord? But nothing. And yet you have poured out your love upon us, Lord. We adore you. We praise you. We love you. And grant us an even deeper desire to pursue you, to know you more, to love you more, to seek you more, Lord. And Lord, for us who are yours, conform us evermore to the image of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to remember, resemble him completely and utterly, Lord. May others look upon us and see, although we are in this sinful tent, people who resemble Christ in some measure, Lord. We ask this for your glory, Father. For my sake, Lord, I pray this evening that your Holy Spirit would come with great anointing and unction here this evening, Lord. I acknowledge my great limitations, Lord, and realise I am but a man who can do nothing without you, Lord. And so I plead, Lord, uh, and ask for your grace and mercy to be extended to you this day, and that you would be so willing to use someone such as myself, Lord, to proclaim the gospel in some measure, and the mysteries of it, the profound mysteries. I thank you for all those who are present, Lord, here this day. If someone does not know you, may this be the day of salvation, Lord. May you visit them richly and powerfully, by the person of your spirit, pointing them to the wonder of your son, that you may be glorified, Father. And I also pray for those amongst us who are struggling, sick, grieving, Lord, whatever the concern may be. It may be emotional, it may be spiritual, it may be physical, Lord. We are multifaceted beings in that sense, Lord. And Lord, you know the great concerns of our hearts. And so I would pray, Lord, that you would meet those who are here this day in their great struggles, and that you would carry them through, Lord. That you would lead them through to a point, Lord, where they feel a liberty to pursue you, Lord. Uh, and, and even in the difficulties that they face, that you would grant them the liberty to pursue you. Let not their circumstances drown out the worship and praise and adoration that should be present in their hearts towards you, Lord. The great redeeming God. The great saving God. The holy God who has saved the people for himself. We love you, Lord. Bless the preaching of the word, save within this town, save within our families, save for your glory, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us sing our next carol here this evening, which is Angels from the realms of glory, wing your flight or all the earth. We'll stand to pray.
Praise God. Let's come to the announcements for the week ahead. It may be a surprise for some of you, but things are as per normal for the rest of the week. Uh, Bible studies go ahead as per normal. So for those of you in the Universal Bible Study, I'll see you there on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Prayer meeting goes ahead as per normal on Wednesday at 7 p.m. And again, I know this is uh, Christmas week, church, and I know you probably still got to go out and buy Christmas presents, but we should be pursuing the Lord in prayer, seeking His face, praising Him for His first coming, um, praising Him for His second coming that will be coming at some point in the future. Um, but let us pursue Him uh, in prayer together on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Saturday evening, we have our carols by candlelight service here at Park at quarter past 11. So I'm looking forward to joining many of you as we praise the Lord on that particular evening. And next Sunday, which is of course Christmas Day, we have our only service of the day brought forward by half an hour. So that's half past 10 in the morning. A reminder there, because I'm, I'm still expecting one or two to come in at 11 o'clock. But it is a reminder that half past 10 next week, um, the only service of the day. There's no evening service on next Sunday. Um, just a thank you to all those who attended the Christmas meal. Uh, we had a lovely time of fellowship and a lovely meal also. Uh, thank you for those who were able to prepare the Christmas uh, booklets for distribution and for those who helped then as well equally uh, in distributing the booklets. Just want to thank you that we were able to get um, the flyers and the booklets out there. And finally, as you come in, some of you may have seen that there's a table out there with envelopes, offering envelopes on the table as you come in in the foyer. Check to see if yours are there. Uh, not everyone will have an offering envelope. Some are paying directly um, straight in and uh, giving their offerings that way. Um, but yes, just check to see if your names are on the offering envelopes in the foyer. And very quickly and briefly, we're remembering a number of you who are sick at this time, struggling, even grieving and remembering the loss of loved ones, our thoughts and prayers are with you all. I remind you as a church to remember to pray for, on that note, to remember <laughs> to pray for those who are struggling uh, in deep grief, because it's quite a low note. Um, <laughs> but remember to pray for one another um, at this time. Christmas is a joyous time for most of us, but some will be fi finding it really a struggle as they remember their loved ones who have gone home to glory. So remember them. Let us sing our next hymn, uh, which is Come um, let us adore him, is it? Yes, come let us adore him. We'll stand to praise. And then we'll come to the ministry of the word. <laughs>
God, uh, I came very close to ministering from the book of Daniel here this evening, but we are going to be turning to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, and verse 18 onwards, through to Matthew 2, and we'll conclude at verse 6. So that's Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 onwards, and just for the point of clarity, reading from the ESV translation. I'll give you a second or two just to find yourself in the Word of God, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. This is how the word of God reads. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and and willing to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people. Israel. We'll close our reading there and may the Lord bless the reading of his word to our hearts here this evening. Now as we come to Christmas and I reflect on some of the Christmas toys my children have had over time, my children have often had doctor sets and they've loved them. In the doctor sets you have a stethoscope and they find the best time to use a stethoscope is when it's nice and cold on your chest or somewhere or anywhere really and to get the best screams do it when one of the parents is sleeping the thermometer is another good one that'll go normally underneath the armpit or between your toes or if it takes your fancy when they're sleeping in your mouth and normally in that sequence as well and then out comes the hammer this is caleb's particular favorite nothing gives caleb joy like using the hammer around the house whacking the floors or the walls or people for that matter as long as he's hitting something uh, he's happy and the knee is a good place for the hammer to hit just to get that knee jerk reaction it's a peculiar sensation and it's also a particular saying isn't it we say it when we want to describe a particular reaction or an immediate reaction to something when john spoke today of god as being sovereign which means that he is perfectly and fully in control nothing is outside of his control we say things like god is all powerful he is ever present he's all knowing and so with those qualities it is safe to say that there is no knee-jerk reactions with god god doesn't respond to anything involuntarily he's never surprised Nothing ever catches the Lord and away. God's responses may seem immediate, but he's really thinking from an eternal perspective because he knows all things and he's seen all things from eternity past. So everything the Lord does is premeditated, considered, for want of perhaps a better word, calculated. But I guess that's the privilege of being God, isn't it? 
The Lord is all-knowing, all-seeing, all-present, all-powerful. And so with that in mind, did the fall of mankind surprise the Lord? Absolutely not. Did Satan have to master plan that blindsided God? Absolutely not. Did the sin of man, which has affected every man and every woman who has ever been born in time, except Christ, of course, surprise God in the very least? Absolutely not. Satan never surprised God. Sin never surprised God. And the Lord's response to the fall of man was never a knee-jerk reaction. And so in those 14 or so verses that I've read here tonight, there were two particular prophecies that were brought to our attention. John covered them this morning. So I'm going to re-plaster them again just so we get that re-embedded into our hearts and our minds. And one of those prophecies here is the rather famous prophecy from Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. It's an amazing verse from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son. A virgin, which is impossible. But it is possible through the third person of God, the Holy Spirit, who we see in Scripture, overshadowed Mary, creating in her the physical body that the eternal Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, would inhabit. And Christ would be a son like no other. One whose very title, not name, title is Emmanuel. God with us. Christ, the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. That's such a famous prophecy as we heard here uh, this morning, over 700 years old, roughly around 750 years uh, before the birth of Christ, I should say more accurately. But then there's a second prophecy mentioned here between Matthew 1 and Matthew 2 in those passages, found in Micah, which again we heard this morning. Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah. They lived at the same time. His prophecy was from a similar moment in time. And that tells us how Herod was able to find out where the Messiah would be born. Because it's in Micah chapter 5. And I love this particular prophecy. It just resonates within my heart. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be named among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me the ruler of Israel, the shepherd of Israel, whose origin is from old, from ancient days. It's another amazing prophecy, as are all the prophecies of Scripture, all with amazing pinpoint accuracy, as you would expect from a God who is omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful. Now, in relation to that particular prophecy, I've said it many times, I'll say it again, it is one of my favourite prophecies in all of Scripture. It tells me of God's eternal plan of salvation through Christ. The details are even as accurate as to say where he would be born, in Bethlehem. 750 years before God would bring it about to be. And so what I'm saying, as quickly as I can, but perhaps even in a long-winded way, is that the coming of Christ was anything but a knee-jerk reaction. It had been prophesied. It had been promised by God. And these are just a couple of singular prophecies. As you go throughout the Old Testament, the Old Testament is littered in prophecies about the coming Messiah. We heard last week that there were promises to kings, namely King David, that there would be one who would rule through his line, the throne of Israel, uh, forever. <coughs> promises to ordinary men and women, like us, promises to Abraham, that there would be one that come from his line, that would um, bless the nations all around the world. Every single nation this is why when we come to Revelation 5, we see that there are people in heaven from all tribes and tongues and peoples and nations. Christ purchased the people from all around the world. And even if you come to the earliest prophecy, which was to the first woman ever made by God, that through her offspring, 
there would be one who would crush the head of the serpent, but he would bruise his heel. Covering quite a lot of what we've heard this morning. But these prophecies are all speaking about Christ, of his coming, redeeming, and reigning work. Nothing crushed the head of Satan like the cross of Calvary. It was the moment that salvation burst into time. Redemption that was available through Christ's atoning work. But when was the first time redemption for man was talked of by God? How early do you have to go back to begin to discuss God redeeming a people for himself? How far back do you really go? Is it 750 years before Christ? Is that far back enough to see you know, God's promised redemption of man? Do you go back to the beginning of creation, to the promise of Eve? Is that far back enough to see God's promised redemption of man? But you'd have to go back before time. Before time ever existed. Before the creation of the earth. We had a string you this, this morning that was representative of time. That string couldn't go far enough. Because it couldn't reach into eternity. And that's where God first declared the redemptive plan of God towards man. Eternity passed. But only the triune God existed. Elohim is a unique name for God. It's the first name for God in, in the Bible. Genesis, right away, at chapter 1, verse 1. El, that term there, is singular. Him is plural. When we say the word seraphim, we are speaking of a plurality of angels. Elohim is a plurality within a singular God. One God in three persons. The eternal God. The self-existing God known as Yahweh. God introduced himself to Moses as I am. He said, I am that I am. Moses saw a bush that did not expend itself in energy when the angel of the Lord was present in the midst of it, when God was present. And that's because God doesn't expend life, doesn't expend energy. He is the source of life. He doesn't burn away. He simply is. Yahweh means the self-existing one. He didn't come to be. We sang already, begotten, not created. No, God didn't come to be. He always was, always is, and always shall be. And before time existed, before time ever was, before the Father ever spoke the universe into existence through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and before the Holy Spirit ever hovered over the, the waters of the deep, God had a redeeming plan for mankind. How remarkable is that? That in eternity past, God was considering you that the cradle of Christ was an eternal plan that would lead to the cross and the redemption of God's people and there in eternity is where the first ever covenant of God was made we saw some of the covenants of God last week but when we consider the first ever covenant it was made in eternity. It was made between the Godhead and it is known as the covenant of redemption. Remember that, church. God deals in covenants and he is a covenant-keeping God. Now, the first covenant in time, not in eternity, but in time, was the Edenic covenant. It was the covenant between God and Adam in the Garden of Eden. It's the first covenant we see in the Bible. The first in time itself. But there was one made in eternity past before it. What is the Edenic covenant? It was a covenant made between God and man. Between God and Adam. Where Adam only had to do one thing. Or more accurately, not do one thing. And that was to eat to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was by its nature a covenant of works. Which is why God said, do not. And Adam failed miserably. 
Sin came into the world through Adam's failure, man's failure to uphold the covenant of God. But because man failed, a saviour was promised that would crush the enemy. And so we see man has made a, a terrible mess. And there is one who has promised who will step into time to correct this terrible mess. And then we probably come to another covenant, which is perhaps even the most famous covenant in the Bible. And that is the law of Moses. The covenant between God and Moses, God and Israel. Again, even though there's an overarching covenant of grace, it is by its nature a covenant of works. Why? Because in Israel only had to obey God in this covenant. And they would be blessed. But if they didn't obey God, they would be curses. And again, as you go through the Old Testament, you see the mess that the nation make in disobeying God. And then the promised Messiah must come to live under the law of Moses, to live it perfectly. And that perfect obedience of Christ gets counted to us who are his, who are redeemed and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. We stand justified before God because of his perfect righteousness. And I guess what? After the completion of that covenant, when that covenant was fulfilled, Christ ushered in a new covenant. It's a covenant of divine grace, sealed and signed in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we see before us here this evening. The imagery of the atoning sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he instituted a new covenant. This is a new covenant made in my blood. For you. This is why we celebrate it. Remembering what Christ had done for us in the institution of the new covenant. When he went to the cross of Calvary. In his atoning work. And so God deals in covenants remember that church but the very first covenant that ever was wasn't made with man because man wasn't there when it took place it was made before time ever was in eternity where only the eternal god existed only the eternal god dwelt there now i wasn't there so how do i know that a covenant took place because the things that happen there in eternity are spoken of in scripture things that occurred before time i'll give you an example did you know that there are a list of names written in the lamb's book of life from before the foundation of the world from before the foundation of the world. Before God created time and made the heavens and the earth, there was a book that contained every name of the redeemed people of God. There was no earth, there was no man, yet there was the book of the redeemed called the Lamb's Book of Life, etched by the hand of God himself in eternity. Jesus once said to his disciples, Rejoice! Rejoice that your names are written down in the Lamb's book of life. Don't rejoice that the demons listen to you, that you can cast out demons. Rejoice that your names are written down in the Lamb's book of life. There is a book in the wonder of heaven that speaks of the redemption of man before sin ever was. What else? Did you know that Christ is called the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world? The great Apostle Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wasn't satisfied there. He took us further back in eternity. Peter said this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He said that you were ransomed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, like that of a lamb without spot and without blemish. He was foreknown. He was chosen before the foundation of the world but was made manifest in these last days for the sake of you who through him believe in him chosen before 
the foundation of the world. Now, there's an amazing amount of truth in that passage that Peter speaks there, but I want to stick to exactly what I'm on here, which is Christ was chosen before the foundation of the world. The Lamb's Book of Life had the names of the redeemed written upon it before time ever was. There was a lamb that was chosen by God, chosen by God to purchase a redeemed people by his shed blood before the foundations of the world was ever laid. What you're seeing here are aspects of the eternal covenant. Things before time ever was. Things before the foundation of the universe and the earth was ever laid. Scriptural. Now we're just a week away from Christmas today. We remember Christ being born to a virgin mother. But I'm telling you, Christ wasn't there by chance. And he wasn't there with a knee-jerk reaction. He was there by the eternal agreement within and between the Godhead. That Christ would come and purchase a people, redeem a bride for himself that was given to him by God the Father before time existed. It was all part of the eternal covenant between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to redeem a people of God and redeem them through Christ's perfect sacrifice. So the story of redemption doesn't begin in time. It doesn't even begin at the cradle. It begins before time ever was. Church, brothers and sisters, you aren't an afterthought in God's redemptive plan. You were loved by the eternal God before time ever was. He bestowed his love upon you. He chose to execute his love upon you. And his love would be so remarkable that his own eternal son would give his life for you. You are not an afterthought. You were in the mind of God before time began. Some of you may not feel loved. How can you not feel loved knowing that truth? He's always loved you. He'll never stop loving you. He'll continue to love you until your head is white, until you breathe your last breath, until you step into glory by the grace of Christ. He has always loved you. So in one sense, and please give you a little bit of liberty here, you were as good as purchased before time ever was. Yes, we needed Christ more than anyone. We needed the cross. We needed his perfect life. We needed Calvary. We needed his resurrection. We needed his ascension. We needed him to be seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for his own. But the moment your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life, salvation was a certainty. Because the Christ was a certainty. The cradle was a certainty. The cross was a certainty. The work of the Holy Spirit and his regenerating work which had raised dead men and dead women to salvation in Christ, was a certainty. He would lead us to repentance and faith. These things were certain. The moment your name was etched in the Lamb's Book of Life before time. At some point in eternity past, there was a mutual agreement between the Godhead to purchase a bride for Christ. One who would be without spot and without blemish, redeemed through Christ's shed blood. A people who would come. They must come. The names are already there. They were listed on the redemption roll in the Lamb's Book of Life. We sing that hymn when the roll is called up. Yonder, when the roll is called up, yonder, I'll be there. Go home, read Revelation 13 and 17 in your own time. But Revelation 13 says this. And all who will dwell on the earth will worship the beast. Everyone whose names were not written before the foundation of the world. In the Lamb's book of life who was slain. You see there is a roll call of the redeemed. Past tense. You see God the Father has given them to Christ. Past tense. Christ said. They will come to me. I will raise them up on the last day. Every single one. I will not lose one of them. We were given to Christ in eternity past. 
These are remarkable truths. You should be rejoicing in this. Rejoicing. Not because Mark Stone says it. Not because I'm preaching it. Because Christ said, rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Christ told you to rejoice. The emphasis he says to his disciples is for you. Rejoice in that truth. If you can't rejoice in that, then you will rejoice in nothing. When Spurgeon spoke of the eternal covenant, the covenant of redemption, as you can imagine, he said it much more wonderfully than me, with greater eloquence, greater power. And uh, it just makes you sick that he was so good. (laughs) But Spurgeon imagined a, a conversation within the Godhead in eternity past. It's not a loose imagination by any stretch of the means, because when you read this, this conversation, it is saturated in Scripture. Saturated in Scripture. See if you can draw many Scriptures, how many Scriptures you can draw from what I'm going to read of Charles Spurgeon's imaginary conversation, a fly in the wall in eternity past between God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spurgeon said this, he said, I cannot tell you in what glorious tongue it was written, I cannot bring it down to a language that is suitable to our ears and to the hearts of mortals. But I say the covenant must have run in words like these. I, the Most High Jehovah, do hereby give unto my only begotten and well-beloved Son a people, countless beyond the number of the stars, who shall be by him washed from sin, by him preserved and kept and led, and by him at last presented before my throne without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. I covenant by oath and swear by myself because I can swear by no greater that these whom I now give to Christ shall be forever the objects of my eternal love. Them I will forgive through the merit of the blood. To these I will give a perfect righteousness. These I will adopt and make my sons and daughters. And these shall reign with me through Christ eternally. And so runs that glorious side of the covenant. But he carries on. The Holy Spirit also, as one of the high contracting parties on this side of the covenant, gave his declaration. I hereby covenant, saith he, that all whom the Father giveth to the Son, I will in due time quicken. I will show them their need of redemption. I will cut out from them all groundless hope. And destroy their refuge of lies. I will bring them to the blood of sprinkling. I will give them faith whereby this blood should be applied to them. I will work in them every grace. I will keep their faith alive. I will cleanse them and drive out all depravity from them. And they should be presented at last spotless and faultless. Another side of this glorious covenant that is continuing even to this day. Finally, Christ covenanted with his father. My Father, on my part I covenant that in the fullness of time I will become man. I will take upon myself the form and nature of the fallen race. I will live in their wretched world. And for my people I will keep the law perfectly. I will work out a spotless righteousness which will be acceptable to the demands of thy just and holy law. In due time I will bear the sins of all my people. Thou shalt exact their debts on me. The chastisement of their peace I will endure. And by my stripes they shall be healed. My Father, I covenant and promise that I will be obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I will magnify thy law and make it honourable. I will suffer all they ought to have suffered. I will endure the curse of thy law, and all the vials of thy wrath shall be emptied and spent upon my head. I will then rise again, I will ascend into heaven, I will intercede for them at thy right hand, and I will make myself responsible for every one of them, that not one of those whom thou hast given me shall ever be lost, but I will bring all my sheep of whom by thy blood thou hast constituted me the shepherd, I will bring every one safe to thee at last. How wonderful are those words. If that doesn't quicken your heart, sure tonight, husbands, wives, turn and give them an exemplary beating. It's filled with scripture. It's as wonderful as a conversation you could ever hope to hear. 
No, the truth is, the Godhead would never have needed to utter a word. Such is the unity between the Godhead, this triune God. But the fact of the matter is this. There is an eternal covenant, as the Hebrews call it, the everlasting covenant, the eternal covenant. You see elements of it again in Philippians 2, where Christ is clearly betrayed as the eternal God who has always existed. But he didn't hold on to his divine privileges that were his by divine right. He willingly subjected himself to the will of the Father. He humbled himself in such obedience to the point of death, even death on the cross. Why did he do it? Philippians 2 concludes with, all to the glory of God the Father. That there is an eternal covenant is no doubt. The Bible is littered with these truths. There was always one who was willing to shed his blood before sin had ever reared its ugly head here on earth. He was the lamb who was slain from before the foundation of the world. The whole host of the redeemed were named in the Lamb's Book of Life before even ever one was ever born. The birth of Christ, the greatest moment in history, is his story from eternity to eternity. The birth of Christ was anything but a knee-jerk reaction. It was, is, and always shall be part of the eternal covenant. And it came about in the fullness of time. In the birth of Christ, Paul said through the Holy Spirit, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoptions as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You can call God the Father, Father today, because Christ came in the fullness of time. Because the Spirit came and revealed that wonderful truth to your hearts. There is no knee-jerk reaction here. The Lord Jesus Christ was bang on time. Exactly as the Father had decreed. The whole plan of God was foreordained right down to the last little details. The Lord wasn't slow in his plan in relation to Christ. He's not slow in his plan in relation to Christ's return. And he was never slow in his pl plan of salvation for you. God's plan wasn't only exact to the when with Christ, but even to the way. I'll be quite quick with this point. Even to where he would be born. Little Bethlehem Ephrathah, you who are too little to be named among the clans of Judah. Little Bethlehem Ephrathah. Some of you may be thinking, why the term Ephrathah at the end? Why wasn't it called just Bethlehem? Well, that's because there were two Bethlehems in Israel. One in the north, one in the south. Just like there's at least two Merthas in Wales. Merthyr Tidwell and Merthyr Mawr, for example. But such is God's love for you that a lot of you were born in Merthyr Tidwell and not Merthyr Mawr. And if you weren't born in Merthyr Tidwell, God was still gracious to you because many of you live here. And many of you have been saved here. So he's doubly blessed you. Born in Merthyr Tidwell and saved. But two Bethlehems. One in the north, one in the south. And the Ephrathites were identified as the south. Marlon and Kilian, Ruth's sons, remember Naomi? She was married to an Ephrathite from Bethlehem in Judea. That is the southern Bethlehem. Jacob's wife Rachel was buried near Ephrathah, which is Bethlehem in the south. You know this one, another famous Ephrathite was Jesse, the father of King David. That's why King David's town and birthplace was Bethlehem. You see, God didn't want Israel to be confused around which Bethlehem he was speaking of. So his Bethlehem Ephrathah identified, revealed, granted revelation to us. It's the southern Bethlehem. This is where the Messiah will be coming. And Herod abused that truth. Slaughtering the many children that it was in that town. What an evil, foolish man. Only a fool can think he can stop God's plan. 
God's plan was from eternity. How does man think he can stop an eternal God in his eternal plan? But that is a deception that Satan has placed upon mankind. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. And as we heard this morning from our brother John so well, even the fact that the Lord was born in Bethlehem was a miracle. Because Jesus didn't live in Bethlehem. The, there was a reason why he was called Jesus of Nazareth because he was from further up north in Israel that's where Mary lived so how did he end up being born in southern Israel in, in, in Bethlehem well that's quite easy you get the leader of the known world at that time to call a census motivated by taxes so that every family was called to where their lineage went back to and because Christ was of the line of David and David was from Bethlehem Mary pregnant with perfect child made her way from Nazareth to the little town of Bethlehem where Christ the Saviour was born. And such a 750 year old prophecy was fulfilled and the eternal covenant of redemption was steamrolling ahead. You see the word of God never ceases to amaze me. God is forever orchestrating his events perfectly and the Lord always will be. Caesar Augustus had a a plan in his heart in relation to taxes and money and the census. But scripture says the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Are oh, you boy? You see, nothing will thwart God's sovereign plan, nothing will delay his plan. Everything will pass as the Lord has declared. Be assured of that. Why? Because he is working all things according to the counsel of his will. And for me, that gives me the greatest comfort, knowing that everything will go according to God's plan in my life. Because God is sovereign. Now, I'm not nullifying your obedience to God. Essentially, everything that God asks us to do is wrapped up in two very basic points. Trust and obey. And I'm encouraging you to do that, church. Trust and obey. How does the hymn go? Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. That little child in Bethlehem was, as you know, none other than the eternal God. And at this moment in time, when he's wrapped in swaddling cloths, the eternal plan of redemption was unraveling. And so I conclude with this. Rejoice. Not in the gifts that you have, not in the great things that you can do for God, but rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life from before the foundation of the world. Are you Christ yet? When the roll is called up yonder, will you be there? Have you pursued him, repented of your sin, placed your faith in him? Have you come to him? You must come to him to be cleansed of your sin. You must come to the Lamb to find forgiveness, to find repentance. Praise the Lord. Praise the Father. Praise the Son and the Spirit for the eternal covenant of redemption. And praise God, I've come to the end of my sermon. Let us bow our heads to pray before we come to the Lord's table. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the eternal plan of redemption. Forgive me for a moment. We do thank you, Lord, that these truths are littered and scattered throughout Scripture, that you have given us wonderful truths that point back to a glorious eternal plan, Lord, an eternal covenant made within the triune God, that you would save and redeem a people for yourself. That you have loved us with an everlasting love. That your son would always come as a lamb who was slain from before the foundation of the world. That your spirit would lead us into all truth. That he will and has sealed us until the day of redemption. These truths are remarkable, Lord. All hinting at the great work that you had in plan since before time began. 
Lord, I would pray, Lord, that for anyone who isn't yours at this time, uh, in time, that this would be the day that they come to salvation, Lord. This would be the day, Lord, that they would come to know the one true God as Lord and as Saviour. And as we come to this table, Lord, help us to reflect on the wonder and the great and glorious truth of the Christ who died for us. We ask this truth in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. Let's sing our next hymn, which is, He will hold me fast. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. Let's stand to praise. sacrifice of the eternal son of God the one who gave himself for us the one who promised to give himself for us before the foundation of the world this is a remarkable picture that we see here this evening a great emblem of the sacrifice of Christ we don't come here as if it means nothing we come here to remember the great and wonderful sacrifice of the eternal son of God this is why scripture says to inspect yourselves and so we should. We should come with a heart that is constantly seeking forgiveness and in repentance. And yet, with great joy, acknowledging the one who gave himself for us. When we come to this table, we come as believers. For those who 
aren't in faith in Christ and he casts no judgment upon you we merely ask that you allow these emblems to pass you by they are to be taken in remembrance of the one that we love and so I would encourage you that this may be a day that the Lord has drawn you to salvation and if you feel the need to repent for your sin place your faith in Christ and I would say come come wholeheartedly come to him who will save you scripture says all who come to me I will in no way cast out so if we truly come to Christ he will truly forgive us of our sins and so I would encourage you to come but you are not his at this time please let these emblems pass you by for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me when we receive the bread we will eat it immediately Father, we thank you for the perfect sacrifice of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the one, Lord, who entered into time and wrapped himself in flesh, the eternal Son of God who became man, gave himself for us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the perfect obedience that he lived under the law of Moses, to uphold your holy character, to impute our righteousness to us, Lord. We thank you for the Christ who went for the cross of Calvary, whose body was broken for us, whose blood was shed in order to redeem a people for himself. We thank you, Lord, that you gave us your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to you this day in love and gratitude and praise for all that you've done for us. In the same way also we took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death <coughs> until he comes. You will retain the cup and drink together.
drink the cup together. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. We are partaking of the table together in remembrance of him because he is ours. And so our, our final hymn is Dear Saviour, Thou Art Mine. Let's sing it as we mean it. Thank you.